second row. Yes. <laughs> Come on in, grab a seat, just fill himself out with any sir. Yeah. Hello. Hi, come on in, take a seat. You're quite safe, don't worry. It's okay, it's only a show. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not that kind of comedian, but it's going to be okay. Oh, okay, cool. And yet you came back. <laughs> there you go, this is our beach now. You won't be on film. It's nice to see some you. Hello, I agree with people who've been before. Uh, listen, I'm a nice comedian. I just might talk to you, but that's going to be it, okay? All right, good stuff. Okay, I'm going to go off because we're feeling. Yeah, I know, I feel bouncy too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, good morning. 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 Impromptu applause. That's <laughs> really lovely of you. How are we all today? Are we good? Yeah. Wow, this is going to be awesome. Listen, guys, I'm not going to lie to you, it's the last day of the fringe. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, honestly, if you, is anyone's first day on the fringe at all? Yes. Oh, this is welcome. Is anybody's first show? Yeah. Oh, fuck. Pressure. Uh, oh, dear. Um, listen, if you go and see other shows today, I'll give you a little top tip. Any comedian you go and see today who comes on goes, Oh, it's lovely to be here. At this stage in the fringe, they are lying. Um, it's okay. I hate to tell you that, but that's just the truth. But I'm delighted that it... This is great. This is the last show and it's sold out. I'm so happy. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I really, it means a lot, really does. Because the thing is, is that when I started doing comedy, everyone told me that the average audience audience is four, right? And so I've done the maths. Fuck yes! <laughs> it's going to be really good. Uh, so it's all going to be good. Right, so, uh, welcome, hello. Uh, this is The Vicar's Husband. This is a show about the fact that my wife is training to become a vicar, and I'm an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> I, sh I should point out that it's not about the breakup of my marriage. Uh, it's going to be okay. I should also point out, if there are anyone here who does have faith, don't worry, I'm not going to... I can watch you. Hello. Hi there. Sorry. No, no, I'm glad I've created an atmosphere where you feel comfortable enough just to chit chat. <laughs> Don't. Um, <laughs> do you remember what I said about filming? That's going to cost me a fucking fortune in edit. Um, so, no, the thing is, it's, it's not about the break of my marriage. Also, I should point out, I've had some lovely audiences. I've had some dodge. I'm not going to lie to you. I've had some scary audiences, right? I had an audience of 14. I can't complain. Twelve of them sat all in the back rows, right? <laughs> Two of them sat right where you, you know, the front here, right? I got to the bit where I said, this isn't really an anti-religion show, right? And both of them just went, oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was like they were clearly like massive atheists. And if you want math as anti anti, this isn't an anti god comedy show, right? For two reasons: one, because I'm the most apathetic atheist in the world, and two, because I need my marriage. <laughs> uh, I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, but our relationship is very strong. Uh, the wife and I, we've been together for 18 years. Uh, we got together after two weeks, got engaged after two weeks. Uh, it's it's worked. It's okay. <laughs> um, the reason being is that uh, well, basically, you know. Who's in a relationship? Who's in a couple here? Right? You, you, guys, you guys are in a couple. How long have you been together? Eight years. Eight years. Congratulations. Eight years is enough. I like the way that you both went. Eight years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, do, a question. Do you both drink? Yeah. Excellent. Have you both seen each other drunk? Yeah. Excellent. Now, that's not the basis of any relationship. I just want to point out. But the basis, I think, the strength of any relationship is if you've seen one of your partners completely pissed as a gourd when you're stone cold sober. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Yeah, everyone goes, oh yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Because the thing is, is that after two weeks together, my wife went to a barbecue and she got so drunk, right? I had to rescue her from this barbecue and it took me 45 minutes to get her from the front door to the bottom of the stairs, yeah. right? Because she was just completely gone, right? Legs were just everywhere and she was getting a little, you're nodding in a group in there, aren't you? Legs, and she was getting a little bit emotional too. It was all a little bit like, I love you. <laughs> I love you. Why are you laughing at me? <laughs> and some of you are looking at me going, oh Aidan, don't be a prick. That's really sweet. And it is, yes, but I haven't told you yet about the snot. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> And you know when someone's that drunk, right? You love them, you know you love them, but all you want to do is you want to get them indoors, get them upstairs, put them in the recovery position in bed, leave them with a bucket and fuck off, don't you? <laughs> that's all you want to do, right? But she was so determined to get to the downstairs loo, and that's when she did the most amazing thing, right? She just went off. Determination, that self control, that's the woman for me. And, uh, and we've been together ever since, it's been great. I mean, so th this has been fantastic. Cool. I mean, obviously, our Sundays are a little bit different now. I mean, I'll, I'll walk her to church, we've got some dogs, so I'll walk her to the church with the dog so she can go and play with her friends. And, um, and it's great because we've got two little dogs, got a Westie and a Staffy. Uh, I got the tattoos after I got the Staffy so I could blend in. And, um, <laughs> Just in case any of you were wondering. <laughs> Didn't seem to match with the voice, Aiden. And, um, and the thing is that I drop her off at church, and it's great, you know, we're all very relaxed about it. I say, oh, have fun with God. And she says, oh, have fun with the existential dread of nothing. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and it's fine, it's fine. I mean, the thing is, is that uh, uh, the, the church, I mean, I don't know if it has faith, don't worry, I don't have lions backstage, I'm not going to release anyone. Uh, but the thing is, is that uh, the thing about the, the, the vicar there, we've got a lovely vicar, but they want you to join in. Because, you know, the, the Church of England, they're lovely people, they're obviously getting benefit, but they want you to join. I'm not saying it's a cult, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's a cult. And, um, <laughs> and they kind of want you to join in, you see, and I'm not, I'm not a joiner, I'm a, I'm a comedian, you know, comedians aren't joiners. And, I think the Christian faith has enough joiners as it is. Well, let's face it, one of them was one. Fuck <laughs> 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 you. Uh, <laughs> do you know what? I did that joke for the first time this spring, right? And a guy came up to me afterwards and said, you do realise that joinery was on a major part of the carpentry until the Middle Ages. Oh, fuck off! <laughs> Betsy, the vicar, she's really lovely, and they're all very keen. She goes, no, Aiden, do come in, do come in, you won't burst into flames. <laughs> I, I said, Betsy, you're the only one in this relationship who thinks that that could possibly happen. <laughs> and then my wife said, no, no, stay, because we're having bacon sandwiches. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Do you mean? Because that's the thing that's going to lure you in, isn't it? I mean, obviously, it's not going to work with all faiths. <laughs> I like that one because everyone goes, oh, well, we like to laugh at that part. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, 
my wife, I mean, I'm learning things. I'm learning all sorts of things. For example, when it comes to the communion, I didn't know. Obviously, you have the wine, you have the blood of Christ, and you have the wafers, the body of Christ, right? And I didn't know that pre the, you know, the gigs, right, they have to guesstimate as to how many people are going to turn up, right? And if they overestimate as to how many wafers they need, they've got leftovers. You can't just throw those away, right? Because they're like the representation of the body of Christ. You can't just chuck them in the bin, right? So Betsy was telling me there's only three ways you can legitimately get rid of them. Right? You can either eat them, burn them, or bury them. <laughs> and see, when she told me this, unfortunately, a little bit too quickly, I said, well, you don't want to bury them, do you? Because three days later, they'll come back. <laughs> Like some kind of zombie Pringle. <laughs> but, um, so yeah, so, so my wife has always supported me up to this point uh, of becoming a comedian, and she's on a path. Like, so she'll be going to uh, like uh, ecumenical college for a couple of years, and then uh, she passes that. She'll become a curate for three years or so, and then there's the trial by fire <laughs> uh, and uh, the live ammunition round, and um, that was Harry Potter, and, uh, and then and then she'll become a vicar. And it's because because for me it's a bit different because I'm, I'm a comedian and we don't have a set path. It's everyone moves at different paces. I, I've got some friends who shot ahead, and I've got some friends who are you know. There's, I'm not saying there's a league table. Well, there is a, there is totally a <laughs> uh, but the thing is is that it's different for comedians it really is I mean for example I remember once driving to a gig and by the way if you ever want to get into comedy that's how you get in get a driving license <laughs> you'll be amazed you'll be amazed how many gigs you suddenly get when you can drive and uh, I remember driving and all of the comedians in the in the car we were all under 10 gigs no one had done more than 10 gigs right and behind me was Sean McLaughlin uh, who's just finished tour support for Ricky Gervais uh, next to him was Angela Barnes, right, okay, uh, who's just uh, obviously on Mock the Week and uh, Radio Force News Jack, right? And next to me in the front was a man who's on a bit of bad luck at the moment. He's down to his last seven television shows. Uh, it was uh, Ramesh Ranganathan. Uh, are we aware of him? Yeah. I didn't know. He's, a, he's in a poor state. He's got a, he's got a Kickstarter page to, to donate. He's, a, he's down to his last three million. And uh, no, I love him. I really do. I really do. And I've never been jealous. I really honestly haven't, right? No, fuck you. I really haven't, right? Because seriously, all I've ever wanted, all I've ever wanted for my gig is I've, I've always been very realistic, right, okay? All I've ever wanted is to hopefully have an audience, right? Air conditioning, and, uh, and maybe one day get on Radio 4. Right? That's all I've ever wanted, right? Okay, well, truthfully, it's all my mum's ever wanted. <laughs> Seriously, I, that's why I was raised with this voice, is so that I could be on Radio 4 one day and get beaten up at school every day. <laughs> um, but no, my mum hasn't made so every so often she's a little bit disappointed, so I do phone her up and she sort of go, Northfoot Zero, Southfoot Zero, strong winds moving in from the west. <laughs> well, she's as happy as Larry. Uh, it's great. But I've honestly, actually, tell you the truth, sir, you kind of shrugged when I said, I, 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 once I was jealous. Right? Uh, would you like to hear the story of when I was jealous? Now that I'm going to do that bit in there because someone's just walked in. Hello! <laughs> Hello, welcome. Uh, right, basically, uh, my wife's training to become a vicar. I'm an atheist. It's all going to be lovely. You're late. You're going to pay for it later. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fine. Um, so, no, there's, uh, there was one time when I was jealous. Um, um, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, basically, I did, a, well, I did a media degree, which means I spent all of my adult life working in a retail. And um, I used to, I, I live in Brighton. Were you aware of Brighton? Yes. Yeah, if you've been, anyone not been to Brighton? A couple of you haven't? Okay, a few other people around. Don't worry, if you haven't been to Brighton, you've probably got an idea of being lovely and full of vegans and hippies and green MPs, which it is. Um, but a lot of it is like that. Unfortunately, a lot of it is also like Jeremy Kyle Live. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, used to, I used to run a pound land uh, on a place in London Road in Brighton. Right? which is a particularly rough part of Brighton, right? Uh, the best way to describe the London Road, now I don't know where everyone is from here, and, and we have too many people to go through, but uh, they're, all, they're all over the UK, these people. Um, the best way to, I don't want to sound snobbish, but the best way to describe it is the people who wear the fleeces. You know the wolf fleece people? You've seen them, haven't you? Usually at bus stops, there's like a blue one, isn't there? There's the ice wolf, right? And sometimes you see the brown version, you know, the desert wolf, right? Yeah, it's true, isn't it? And no one knows where the fuck those people have come from, but I'll tell you where they're going, the London Road in Brighton. 
<laughs> so this is, uh, this is a totally true story. Now, I know when you get a comedian on stage and they go, it's a totally true story, and they go, oh, mate, you're making half this. Like, Trust me, I am not making anything up in this show. This is one of the few shows I've been able to do where everything is totally true. And this is the true story of when I got made. Like, oh. So there I am. I'm in my Poundland store, right? It's Monday morning, 10 o'clock. I've got two aisles. There's me and one other guy. That's all the people who I've got in, right? He's on the till. I'm loading up the crisps, right? A woman arrives. Bear in mind, it's Monday morning, 10 o'clock. She's 20, 25 years old. She is pissed as a fart. <laughs> she is absolutely out of her gorge. I know this because she announces her arrival with the oh so eloquent statement of oh fucking hell it's pound lad <laughs> <laughs> and I look up the oh god I see she's with a guy now I'm not Sherlock Holmes right but he's clearly on some kind of drugs right because he's just doing this <laughs> but they both seem quite happy. So who am I to get in the way of their Monday morning revelry? Not I. Right? <laughs> they go down the first. Oh, they make it halfway down. She says the thing that everyone says in Poundland. You've probably said it yourself. You know the sentence. Oh, I wonder how much this is. Oh, I got off it to town. <laughs> 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 so she comes round the corner, right? She sees me straight. She goes, come straight up to me. Goes, excuse me, excuse me. Where are you, Chris? <laughs> she says, no mate, no mate, where's your Monster Munch? I go, I'm terribly sorry, I'm afraid we're out of Monster Munch, I'm afraid we haven't had Don't you lie to me! I know you've got the Monster Munch! Where have you hit the bloody Monster Munch, you bastard? Where the hell is that? I go, whoa! You need to calm down, right? She then gets bags of crisps, chocolate bars, cans of drink, throwing everything she possibly can at me. It's just madness. I pull out my phone, I go, you need to stop, I'm gonna phone the police. She stops dead, right? There's a moment's silence. You know, like when you've ever had to deal with someone really, you know, like in your house at night. You know, when you've had to really deal with someone really drunk and you just don't know what the fuck's going to happen next, right? It was probably just a nanosecond, but it felt like an hour, right? And she just looked at me, right? I looked at the guy, and he's. He's fine, right? And out of nowhere, right? She just goes, ah! Pedophile! Ah! She then runs the entire length of the store, screaming, R, R, pedophile, R, R, pedophile. Comes up the other side, right, doing the same. I just step over the gap as if that stops her dead, as if to go, how the fuck did he do that? <laughs> she then starts throwing shampoo bottles at me, deodorant cans, like everything she possibly can. Eventually, I corral her out of the store, look at my colleague at the till, who's just going, yeah. <laughs> and I'm looking at the people in the queue and I'm thinking, well, welcome to the London Road in Brighton. <laughs> <laughs> and then I remember the guy. He hasn't left. <laughs> so I look down the first aisle and he's not there. And I look down the second aisle and there he is. He's right down at the end. He's in the book section, right? And he's picked up a specific book, and I know which one it was, because I'd only put them out that morning. It was these little stubby red Spanish-English dictionaries, right? I know, only a pound. <laughs> and he's got the book up here. I can't quite see what he's doing with it, but from the angle I'm at, it looks like he's trying to inhale the book. <laughs> and I'm thinking, that's not how you learn Spanish. <laughs> So I get a bit closer, right, and I can see what he's actually doing, because he turns, and what he's actually doing, no word of a lie, he has the book, he has a lighter, he is burning the cover of the book because he is smoking heroin off the cover of the book. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure I don't want him doing this. <laughs> now, as some of you may have gathered, I'm quite an alpha male, right? And, uh, fuck off. And, um, <laughs> I get a bit closer and I deal with it in the most alpha male possible way, right? I just go, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> and he just turns and goes, what's the problem? I said, well, you're, you're, you're burning a book and you're smoking heroin in a pound lander. Like, outside it'd be fine, you know, life choices. Um, and he was lovely. He just said, oh, uh, would you want me to stop then? And I was like, yeah. He said, oh, I suppose you want me to leave now. And I was like, yeah, would, would that be okay? He was like, yeah. Now, I know the long-term effects of heroin use must be quite bad, but quite frankly, as far as his behaviour was concerned, everyone should be on heroin. <laughs> it was an utter delight, right? Right up to the point where he said, well, could I at least take my book with me? And that's when I got really angry, because it wasn't his book. He hadn't paid for it. And I'm sitting there arguing with him, and I think, what am I doing with my life? I'm 47 years old. I'm reasonably good at talking to people on stage, and yet there I am in a pound land on the London Road in Brighton having an argument with a drug addict over a one-pound Spanish dictionary, which is effectively a very, very long-winded way of saying it's really nice to be here at the fringe. <laughs> 
so I, I, I get in my car, I, I'm just thinking, oh, I can't do this anymore, I can't do this. I get in my car, I turn on the radio, Radio 4's on. Got any Radio 4 fans in? Three, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> this next ten minutes going to fly. <laughs> I said that the other day and I had the weirdest heckle I've ever had in my life. Guy said, where you are, sir, there's an older gentleman, he's about 90 years old, right? I went, any Radio 4 fans? He went, I hate Radio 4. <laughs> <laughs> I've never encountered such vehemence, right? But then, before I could work out what to do, he just backed it up by going, it's Radio 3 for me, all the way. <laughs> <laughs> Those guys are militant, man. <laughs> so I turned on, I turned on the car and Radio 4's on. And there's a show called A Good Read, uh, which if you haven't heard, is basically uh, just a lovely presenter. It's the most Radio 4 of Radio 4 shows. There's a lovely presenter, and there's two guests, and they've all chosen a book. Lovely. And they're all just going to have a lovely chat about books. Lovely. Right? You just need that and Gardner's Question Time and your blood pressure. Goes, right? <laughs> and I thought, oh, this would be great, right? And I turned on just in time for the announcer to say, and our other guest today is Ramesh Ranganathan. <laughs> and I know it's pathetic and I know it's trivial, but I found myself getting jealous. And I thought by myself, my God, look what I've done all day is just argue with drug addicts. And it looks like the only show that I could get on on Radio 4 that none of my colleagues have is Farming Today. <laughs> <laughs> so I get home and I'm, I'm speaking to my wife and I said, well, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do this. And she's been fantastic. She just says, well, look, the comedy's doing well. It's doing better. You know, we can, we can make that work. And I've got the Vicar stuff going. We can make that work as well. And, and she's always been there for me. She's never let I me. Mean, she's so amazing. She really is, right? She's backed me up all the way. She's never denied my wanting to be a comedian. She said, let's go for it. So who am I to get in the way of her becoming a Vicar? Do you know what I mean? Who am I to get in the way of her dream? Who am I to get in the way of her calling, you know, to potentially have a five-bedroom vicarage in Sussex? I'm not going to lie to you guys, that place is a fucking awesome. <laughs> Uh, but no, seriously, I think my wife's going to be an amazing vicar, I really do, because she, she just loves everyone, she just cares, you know, she's very much in the sort of lovely end of the Christian pool, do you know what I mean? It's all very, let's all be nice and lovely or whatever, and, and uh, you know, the Bible is a guideline, and I'm, as I said, the most apathetic atheist in the world, I, I just think that, you know, people fuck it up on both sides, whether they be extreme atheists or zealots, do you know what I mean? But zealots on either side, they just fuck up everything, I mean, zealots fuck up religion, and politicians fuck up politics, and vegans fuck up vegetarianism. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you guys, that gag didn't work out well in Brighton. <laughs> but I, mean, I, think, I think she's going to be great, because I think she's going to be fun. Um, because, uh, well, one of the things that I think is going to be fun is the fact that she's a massive fan of the popular beat combo Green Day. Uh, has anyone heard of this band? Yeah. Yeah. I realise I said like the most dad thing ever by going the popular beat combo Green Day. <laughs> um, but she's a mass, she's like a super fan, right? So much so that I could stub my toe, right? And she'll go, oh, well, Billy Joe Armstrong, the lead singer of Green Day, once stubbed his toe. I'm like, I don't care! Do you know what I mean? It's that kind of mentalness, right? And the thing is, is that just for fun, what she does now is she adds Green Day lyrics into all her sermons. <laughs> <laughs> so I just think it's awesome. Do you know what I mean? It has, however, led, right, in a led to the best and only heckle I've ever heard in a church. Right? Uh, we went. Uh, we only did a week here last uh, last year because you know they wanted a proper holiday. Uh, so we went. Uh, we went camping in France because I had a desperate need to hear Frenchmen fart half a mile away at night. And, uh, why? Why camp? I don't understand camping. Uh, Angela Barnes has a lovely line. It's like basically why? Why? Why, why pay money to stay somewhere shitter than where you live? <laughs> so, it's like even when I was at uni, even when I was at uni, people go, wait, we're going to Glastonbury. I was like, yeah, which hotel are we staying in? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we went along, and obviously we're listening to a lot of Green Day in the car, and obviously my daughter's with us as well, she's 13, so we're listening to a lot of her favourite band, which is My Chemical Romance. Uh, which, so there's knots there from the young people in the front, yes, uh, I, you know, they've got a good beat. And um, I realised again that was even Dada, wasn't it? Uh, it's was ridiculous. So we're listening to like, all these things. Consequently, my wife becomes obsessed, right, with, with the, my chemical romance and tries to sneak their lyrics into one of her sermons, which massively backfires. When both of them go to church one day, I go to pick them up. I can hear my wife giving the sermon, and all of a sudden, I just hear my daughter go, That's not fair, Mum! That's my band! <laughs> <laughs> So I, I wanted to help, you know, I 
wanted to help because she's helped me with the comedy. Like, the worst thing in the world, if, if you're a partner of a comedian, it's terrible because every all comedians, you start with your five minute sets and, and when you change things, like for the first thousand times you do it, then your poor partner has to hear it, you know. And you <laughs> seriously, you sit there and they just go, I've got a new bit. Really? Is it really new? Yes, it's a totally new bit, but I have to do the five minutes because otherwise it won't make sense. Is it really new? Yes, it's completely new. Is it really new? Really? Yes, it is really new. Is it really? It's, I've changed a comma. <laughs> so, so I thought, you know, she's put up with a lot from me, so I wanted to, I wanted to get her a Prezi, right? And the problem is, is I do want to get her like roses and chocolates, and, you know, that's just anything. I wanted to get something meaningful. And I had a look, and I thought what well, might be fun, because she's got so much learning to do, right? I thought, because you can get audio Bibles. Right? You can, you can get like the thing. I thought this would be good. She could listen to things while she's reading other things and saving the planet. And um, I thought this would be fun. And uh, some actors have done, like for example, David Suchet, him from Poirot fame, has done, I don't think he's done it in the Poirot voice. Uh, by the, I, don't, I don't think it's like, it was a centurion on the mound. <laughs> With the good and sticky things. I don't think it's that kind of deal, you know. And I thought, well, I'll get that for her, right, okay? Um, but it's like 150 quid, right? And I love her dearly, but, you, you know, and it's... I thought, well, what I could do is because I've got the Radio 4 voice, oh, right? And also, because there might be voiceover agents in, Okay. Um, I thought well, I could record the Bible for her. I could do the audio Bible for her, right? And I was in a position recently where I had the time to do it, which I'll, I'll tell you about later. But I thought, I could just record this. This will be fine, because I've got the Radio 4 voice, haven't I? It's like, in the beginning, God. That's a good voice. <laughs> the problem is, right, I, I got a little bit bored. Right? Well, no, because you know like when a friend goes on a holiday and they bring a book back and they go, oh, you've got to read this book, it's amazing, and you get halfway through and you go, oh, I'll wait for the movie. Do you know what I mean? It, the, the Bible was like that for me. It's fun. No, not enough car chases. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm, um, so, so I, I thought, I'm, I'm like, oh, well, I can't help it, I got a bit bored. And the problem is, I should, I should point out, bless you, I should point out that, uh, <laughs> We've had to script that every day. Um, I don't do impressions, I should point out, but I, I do sort of do impressions of other people's impressions, right? And I'm not saying they're great voices, but look, wait, you, you'll probably see where I got a bit bored. I, I got as far as the Gospel of Mark, uh, which coincidentally is my wife's favourite gospel. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, apparently she doesn't like John uh, because John has several different ghostwriters and uh, therefore doesn't have a clear narrative structure. <laughs> therefore, making John the Katie Price of the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> if it's true, everyone who laughed is going to hell. You know? <laughs> So see, so, <laughs> I'm having fun. Um, so see if you can spot where I, uh, I, I basically got bored. <clears throat> Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. <laughs> Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said, "Stand in front of everyone." <laughs> Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? <laughs> to shave life or to kill? <laughs> and the people said, you are the son of God. <laughs> uh, I don't think she's got that far yet because she hasn't punched me. <laughs> I'd like to point out, if you, if you do get as far as the book of Revelations, uh, which is quite a heavy read, uh, it's a lot more entertaining if you do it in the voices of Pinky and the Brain. <laughs> what, are, what are we going to do tonight when the fourth angel blows his trumpet, Brain? Well, we do every apocalypse, Pinky, trying to take over the world. <laughs> Give a pipe, 
minutes. Sorry, five minutes. I've already gone out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, seriously, you look like you're yeah, asthma. No. Okay. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so the thing is, right? Is, so I read the Bible, and it's a good read. It's a good read. I mean, you know, it's a page turner. I can see why it's been so successful. And, um, I can see why the movie adaptations have been quite tough. And um, I am. Um, yeah, and it's just stories, isn't it? It's just parables. And it just reminded me about like some stories I've heard. And I was reminded, I've forgotten, about when I was 15, I was lucky enough to meet the best storyteller I've ever met. Um, he, my mum started cooking for this, this older gentleman who needed help, and he was 80 years old at the time. And she came back and she said, you've got to meet this man. He's incredible, right? And his name was John Trevelyan. And he was the British Board of Film Censor Chief from 1958 to 1971. Right? And this man could tell a story, right? He told me like amazing stories. You know like when you hear a good storyteller, you don't care if it's true or not, do you know what I mean? And it's, it's just lovely to hear great stories. He would tell me stories about like David Niven and Cary Grant and meeting Andy Warhol and all these people. He told these most amazing stories. He was fantastic. I found a picture of him on the internet. Everyone can see this all right. There he is. There's John, cigarette in hand. He would smoke constantly. Right? Uh, and I remember once going to see him, and he'd, um, he'd stopped smoking, but he still had the cigarette, just to, sort of for the, for the habit, you know. And he had a great voice, and I said, have you quit? And he said, I've decided to quit, it's very bad for you, you know. Like, so, <laughs> and, and I went back a week later, and the entire place surrounded in smoke. And he started off, and said, you started smoking again, John? He said, well, I felt terrible, I went to the doctors, and the doctor said, well, look, fuck it, it's not going to make any difference now. <laughs> 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 and he said it with such palash, do you know what I mean? It was just amazing. And there were two stories that really sprung out that I remembered, right? One of which, I'm not going to lie to you, has like sort of split groups, right? Okay? Uh, I just pre-warn you. I think we're going to be okay today. And the other one I think is a delight. Both of them involve a film director called Anthony Mann. And he and John were like thick as thieves, right? And Anthony was a massive perfectionist. And one day they had to go to like a crematorium, right? For a, for a ceremony, right? And they turn up, and the, uh, the lighting's not right. And this isn't good enough for Anthony, right? So what Anthony does is he goes, you keep everyone back, John. I'll go and sort it all out, right? He goes over to the thing, finds the control switch, and starts flicking the switches to get the lighting right, unaware that he flicks one switch, and the coffin slowly <laughs> Yeah, that's the horrific one. <laughs> Uh, needless to say, the guys in the other room went, oh, it's here. <laughs> <laughs> and I told you it's split rooms. <laughs> the other one, though, is a delight, right? The other one is amazing. In 1968, he and John, he and uh, Anthony were invited to the Moscow Film Festival, right? And obviously it's during the height of the Cold War, right? And the problem is, of course, is so they get a visit from MI6, right? And this man turns up and gives them a bit of a lecture and warns them that, you know, they will be recorded at all times, they will be filmed at all times, right? And also, as well, of course, they will be try they'll try to blackmail them, they'll try and entice them, there'll be recording devices everywhere. They must be absolutely careful that they hold the dignity of the British Empire. So you do this by getting absolutely pissed. <laughs> so they're in their hotel room and they suddenly remember, right, that there's listening devices somewhere, right? So what they do is they think, well, we've got to find them, right? So they start walking around, they like move the beds, right? They lift up carpets, they look behind curtains, right? There's, oh, there's a chest of drawers, let's move the chest of drawers. They move the chest of drawers, right? And there in the wall, right, just behind the chest of drawers, right, is a door. You can't even see it from a certain angle, it's there. So they open it up, and inside, right, is the listening device, this electronic listening device with wires coming out of it. So they order up room service, they order up caviar for two so they can both have knives, because they're going to take it apart. <laughs> But it's not the listening device. Of course it isn't. It's the electricity junction box. <laughs> 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 Which John confirms when he shoves his head <laughs> gets blown across the entire room. But of course,
course, in John's version of the story, what that does is that fuses the electrics for the entire hotel, therefore stopping the KGB's recording equipment, and therefore single-handedly saving the British Empire. <laughs> Stories like that is, the, I mean, the things with the Bible, the stories in the Bible, you have to take those on faith, don't you? Because that's how religion works. You take those on faith and, and you live by those stories. And, and the things with John's stories, I, I kind of didn't want to check if they were true or not because I loved them so much, right? But unfortunately, we've got great temptation in this world and it's called Google. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'll, I'll go and have a look. And, and I, I'm glad I did because I think, I think it was all true, right? I found a photo of him with Andy Warhol. And then I found this incredible photo of him and David Niven, I hope in character. <laughs> and I, and I, I was feeling really happy about everything <coughs> until I found this one. <laughs> He's everywhere! <laughs> But I think, um, so I think my problem with religion is, is not so much the people who believe or the people who don't believe. I think my problem is the people who suddenly believe. You know, like at Christmas. Christmas is the one that sits every... I mean, everyone goes nuts at Christmas, don't they? Everyone's like, oh, well, we've got to go to midnight mass. You go, why? You didn't go the other 364 days of the year. Why do you suddenly feel compelled to go now? Well, we've got to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Really? When did that happen? December the 25th. Celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Definitely happened December 25th. Nothing to do with the equinox? No, definitely. September the 25th. December the 25th. That's what we're definitely doing. We're definitely doing it because we're going to celebrate the birth. And usually to those people, I say, okay, so he died. He was born there, right? When did he die? Aprilish. <laughs> sure, isn't it? Christmas is absolutely set in stone. Easter is a movable feast. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. And no one, as far as I'm aware, was mental enough about Christmas apart apart from my grandmother. Right? My grandmother, right, was the maddest woman ever when it came to Christmas. Right? She was definitely couldn't give a shit about anybody until oh, well, we've got to celebrate. The, you know, she was one of those. Right? And she was an East End landlady. Right? She ran several pubs in the East End land. Anyway, Anyone old enough to remember Peggy Mount? Yes. A few of you actually remember Peggy Mount? For those of you not, uh, do you remember Pat Butcher from EastEnders? Yep, yep. Yeah? Imagine her, but without the earrings and none of the charm. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was a tough dame. She was a real matron. You did not mess with Gran, right? Okay? Because if Gran said something was happening, it was going to bloody happen, right? Okay? <laughs> and the thing is, is that uh, she eventually worked in the West End of London and, and ran the Theatre Royal uh, pub uh, where she appropriated a chandelier. <laughs> and obviously gained a vocabulary. And, um, and the thing was, is that uh, in 1976, her and granddad retired out to a little village called Ickham near Canterbury, right? And they moved out in the middle of December. They bought, did you know Ickham? Uh, yeah. yeah. They, they bought, uh, they bought uh, basically two little tiny cottages next to each other, right? Pretty much the same floor space here. The idea being is what they do is they knock the wall in between down so they can have a larger little floor space, larger living space, and a bedroom each. Because uh, they hated each other. Because <laughs> you know, that's what you did in those days. You made a choice, you were stuck with it, boy. And um, so they also announced to everybody that even though they've moved in the middle of December, right, we're all going to theirs for Christmas dinner, right? We're all going to Christmas dinner. You're, you're nuts, Grand. It's not going to be. We're all going to. You're all coming here for Christmas dinner because we're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. And in her own words, we're going to do it proper. <laughs> <laughs> However, she said, we're going to do it proper, but we're not having turkey. Right? We're not having turkey, no one likes turkey, there's a reason why you only have it once a year. It gets dry too quick, it tastes like shit, we're going to have fish. <laughs> fine, because no one's going to argue with Gran. <laughs> fine, absolutely fine. Right? So, December the 24th rolls round, right? and all that's happened, there's a massive hole in the wall, and Gran has knocked down the stairs going up to her bedroom. Right? <laughs> She's going up and down a ladder. <laughs> just a ladder, just hanging there. 68 years old, this seems perfectly rational to her. Oh, she'd had a hip operation previously as well. Didn't feel right, but still do matter. <laughs> so, Christmas Eve, she wakes up four o'clock in the morning. She realises something's not right. right. Okay. Obviously, the living room needs painting and the chandelier's there on the floor. Right? But she realises what the problem is, is that you can't celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. In her own words, you can't celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ and do it proper if you haven't got a turkey. You've got to have a turkey, haven't you? Nothing to do with the fact it's got to do with the Americans from 100 years before, but still. <laughs> 
So instead of waking up her husband and getting him to drive, no, she puts on her coat and walks the eight miles into Canterbury through the snow to try and find a turkey. Now, it's 1976, there's not 4,000 Tesco metros on every corner, right? She walks a further eight miles around Canterbury, desperately trying to find a turkey. Eventually, she finds the last remaining turkey that couldn't sell because it was too bloody big, right? And eventually she buys it and it weighs, no word of a lie, 38 pounds. <laughs> This thing is enormous. It's so big she can't even carry it, right? So the butcher cuts it in half. And with 19 pounds on each arm, she walks the eight miles back. This is not rational, is it, right? She gets home. Granddad goes, where the fuck have you been? She goes, I bought a turkey. I thought we were having fish. We're having turkey. Okay, because no one's going to argue. <laughs> The thing is, this thing is enormous. It won't fit into one oven, right? But luckily, she's still got two kitchens. So she puts one half in one oven, one half in the other oven, does the maths that only Stephen Hawking and grandmothers can do. <laughs> and realises this thing's got to start cooking at about three o'clock in the morning, right? So then, finally, after walking 30-odd miles and lifting this thing all the way back, doing all this ridiculous thing, she does exactly what you would expect a 68-year-old woman with hip problems to do. Yeah! She paints the living room. <laughs> so, she puts one half in, she sets it off, right? Comes back, realises I'm going to start basting this thing at six o'clock, right? Because it's going to need basting, isn't it? Because otherwise it's going to go dry, because, you know, I don't want to dry turkey. She gets up six o'clock in the morning, comes down her ladder, right? Has a look, sort of goes, no, nah, something's still not right. You know, there's a smell of fresh paint in the air, right? So she starts basting one, you know, closes the door, goes back, basting the other side, and then she realises what it is. It doesn't look right. It doesn't look right. Because if you're going to celebrate and do it proper, it's got to look right. <laughs> so she gets both halves of the turkey and sews it back together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making this shit up. <laughs> It's too big now, so she can't fit it in the one oven, right? So what she does, right, she can't, she tries to squeeze it in. So what she does, she gets the 24 different types of vegetables she needs, right, to prepare for that day. Gets herself a chair to sit down, gets herself a stool, puts that against the oven door, then puts her foot against the oven door, resting on the stool, and starts peeling potatoes. <laughs> Granddad wakes up about 8.30, 9 o'clock, comes downstairs and goes, what the fuck are you doing? She explains, he says, okay, because no one's going to argue with Grant, right? And then what he does, he doesn't help, because what he does, he constructs it like a Heath Robertson contraption of tables, chairs, a television set, and a lawnmower, right, to wedge against the opposite wall to keep the oven door shut. Because finally, after no sleep and all this thing, she does exactly what you would expect a woman to have to deal with at that moment in time. Yep, she hangs the chandelier. <laughs> <laughs> so three o'clock in the afternoon rolls round, right? We've had the Queen's speech. There's this amazing table, 24 different types of vegetable. There's a smell of fresh paint in the air. There's this huge, ridiculous chandelier that's too big for the bloody Albert Hall, just hanging down there like this. <laughs> and underneath it is this huge, ridiculous turkey with two great big, different coloured fuck off bootlaces going up and down. <laughs> declares Christmas open. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> it's proper now, it's proper, right? And everyone tucks in and silence reigns across. Because that's what Christmas is all about, really. Let's face facts. 16 hours of hard work for 10 minutes of silence. <laughs> and everyone's tucking in and then Uncle Bert ate a bit of turkey, right? And I'd never heard Uncle Bert speak before. And he just said, oh, turkey's really dry, girl. <laughs> Uncle Bert died three days later. <laughs> I don't know whether it was Grand or the Lord, but someone was moving in a mysterious way. <laughs> So, I don't, you okay? I'm <laughs> <So, laughs> sure you could come again. Um, so listen, I, I obviously, I, I, you know, I said I, I don't believe, I don't believe in heaven, I don't believe in hell, um, but I found myself recently uh, believing in purgatory. Um, I, I went to purgatory because um, I got a gig on a cruise ship. Uh, has anyone been on a cruise ship before? Yes. A few of you have. There you go. Uh, you'll probably just. You okay? Did you have fun? 
okay, cool. All right, you're probably on a nice one, right? Now, the thing is, is that I don't know what everyone else views of cruise ship, because I thought this would be great, right? I thought this is going to be a great thing. The wife, she's all set on her path. I'm going off to do comedy, and I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes I've done some really crap gigs, I've done things, and I thought this would be okay. This would be a paid gig, right? I'm getting paid. I've got 12 nights on board a cruise ship. I'm going from London to Amsterdam <coughs> to, La Bless you, to La Rochelle, right? Down to Bilbao in Spain, Lisbon, Gibraltar, La Coruña in the north of Spain, and then back up to London. 12 nights, right? Now, when you were on the cruise ship, did you have shows in the evening? Was there shows on? See, sometimes with cruises, the way it works is very simple. Uh, there's 2,000 people on board, right? There's a thousand seater venue, right? And the deal is, is that at 7 o'clock, you either watch a show or you have dinner. So if you're an act, you just do the same show at 7 o'clock at 9 o'clock, and then the next day, on another day, you do another show at 7 o'clock at 9 o'clock. So I'm booked to do my 10 films of my dad's show, right, okay, which I've done for eight years, very popular, done it all around the world, by the way, 8 o'clock in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is going to be fine, right? They've seen my clips, they know the kind of person I'm going to be, I think this is going to be fine, right? Now, I don't know about you guys, but when you turn up for a gig, right, as a comedian, you know whether it's going to be good or not. You do, instantly. You walk into a room, you just know. I walked in today, and sometimes you go, oh, these guys are going to be good, they're going to be lively, it's going to be fun, it's going to be excellent, right? Okay? Sometimes you walk into a gig and go, oh. <laughs> oh. And you just feel it, it's going to be bad, right? And the thing is, is, I walked on this ship, and I knew it was going to be bad, right? And I'm not going to lie to you, I've turned up for gigs early before and realised it was going to be bad, but I've never turned up for a gig six days before the gig and lived with the audience. <laughs> <laughs> now I got on board. Now I don't know what your view of uh, of cruise ships were. I had this kind of view that it was something like an Agatha Christie novel. Do you know what I mean? I thought it was going, oh, shuffleboard at two, of course, Lord Peterson. I got delighted. <laughs> As soon as I solved this murder, I did all this big love there, right? No, no, no. The one I was on was a Weatherspoons on Sea. <laughs> now, the thing is, is I don't know what your politics are, and I don't care. Let's face facts, it causes too many arguments these days. But I've already told you I'm from Brighton and I vote Green, so you've probably got a fair idea where I'm coming from, right? And the thing is, is I get on board and instantly I see two people, right? And I don't want to be judgmental, but they were both wearing wolf fleeces. <laughs> and they were arguing, but they weren't arguing. Arguing, they were actually violently agreeing with each other. You know when you've seen people go, oh, it's a bloody, it is a bloody, oh, I'll tell you, I'm so angry. Well, I'm bloody upset too. Oh, and you know they're going to look at you and catch your eye and go, don't you think, don't you agree? And you're supposed to go, oh, fuck off. Do you know what I mean? You just don't know how to deal with that. And I've signed a contract. I'm not allowed to upset anyone. I'm not allowed to swear. I'm not allowed to do anything wrong. And the thing that was driving me nuts, right, okay, is that they were arguing, stroke agreeing violently about the fact that the exchange rate had collapsed and this wasn't what they expected when they voted for Brexit. <laughs> it took all of my strength not to go up to them and go, because of you! <laughs> Always splits the room. <laughs> Whichever way you vote, you guys, don't worry, I'm sure it's all going to be fine. <laughs> So I think, well, maybe I'm misjudging. I get to my room. I've got a lovely cabin, a lovely double bed cabin. I've got an, you know, I've got ensuite and everything. I've got a window. I've got a view. It's of a lifeboat, but I've got a view. <laughs> and I think, well, I'll go along to the seven o'clock show. There's a seven o'clock. There's a welcome show, right? I think I'm misjudging this, it's going to be fine, right? Mm -hmm. I turn up and it's full on Butlins on Sea. <laughs> oh, it's show tunes and everything, and I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. Right? <laughs> and then the cruise director comes out, right? Now he comes out, and I can't emphasize enough how much everything is true in this story, guys, right? Because he just comes out and just goes, Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Charlie. Lovely to see so many familiar friends. Hello, Maureen, you're all right. Listen, new people too, the important thing you've got to remember is the way when you're on board with us, when you're on board with us, it's not just a cruise ship, it's a friendship. Oh. Oh. <laughs> no, guys, they love that. <laughs> and, and then he talked it off by going, my name's Tony, in case you forget, very easy to remember, Tony, Tony. <laughs> but guys, that was gold. A thousand people were wrong, sorry, 999 people were wrong with laughter. One guy was just going, oh fuck. <laughs> so 
So I go to, and I leave in the theatre, you've got to go past all these bars. So I'm thinking, no, maybe I am misjudging it, maybe I'm being wrong. I bump into people, because I'm chatting to people, trying to, you know, you, you do, you kind of, you know, the fringe you do as well, don't you? I talk to some couples, and they go, oh, what are you doing here? And I'm very self afraid I don't like to do that. Well, literally, I'm the comedian. And they go, oh, oh, we love comedy weed. Barbara, oh, did we... Jim Davidson, are you anything like him? No. <laughs> oh, if you are, we'll come and see you. Definitely come and see Please don't. <laughs> so I go, I go with the thing, right? And I go, we okay? Need that chair. Need that chair? Oh, I'm sorry. Did okay. it come from the pop room? It did. I thought we could get away with it. Sorry, my mistake. No, it's okay. Don't worry. I've been a bad boy. Hang on, I'll just put you on hold. Do. It's a seamless, seamless. You are in a queue for the Wicked's husband. <laughs> And we're back. Now we're back. Hey! So, I go to think. So, I, I spend a very, very sleepless night, right? I'm terrified. Seven o'clock in the morning, I wake up, go to the buffet restaurant. I think I'll just go and eat a load of bacon. This will help things out, right? And I get there, and there I meet Jean. And Jean saved my life on this journey, right? Jean was amazing. She was like a very young, vibrant 70 year old. You know, you wouldn't have been able to guess her age, right? She was fantastic. And she introduced herself in the most amazing way possible, right? She just came up to you and went, what the fuck are you doing here? I thought I was the youngest. I thought, oh, oh, I like you. You're good, right? And I, I said, well, I'm the comedian. She goes, oh, that's a shame. You seem fun, but I don't like comedy. It's not my cup of tea. I won't come and see you. I hope you won't mind. I was like, no, Jean, not at all. If anything else, we will now be the best of friends. <laughs> because there's no level of expectation. I thank you guys for coming, but I'm sure somebody thought, well, we'll give it a chance. Do you know what it's like? You don't know, do you? There's that level of expectation. But when that's removed, that's fine, you can get on like a house on fire with people, right? I mean, she was amazing. She was a doctor in the army for 25 years, and for one point she lived in Gibraltar. So that's why she was going back, just to see where she used to live, right? And uh, she was great, so we'd meet every, every, every morning at seven o'clock for breakfast, right? And then I'd go and hide. Um, now it comes to Friday night, the first gig, right? And I've been pre-warned. There's another act on board. He's a he's a comedy magician, right? Okay, little evidence of it. And um, I know the karma gods are going to pay, right? Uh, and, and so he he, he pre-warns me. He says at seven o'clock. He goes the seven o'clock show's a little bit tough, right? It could be a little bit tough because they haven't had enough to drink, they're worried about their dinner, and the bingo's still on, right? <laughs> and, um, and also, he said, but the nine o'clock show is a delight. It's a delight, right? So I do the seven o'clock show, I do ten, and I, 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 I'm not going to lie to you guys, it's a tough gig, right? It's a hard gig, there's lots of, like, sort of polite smiles, right, okay? <laughs> but there's, there's one smiley, happy lady, and she, there's always one smiley, happy person in the gig, and, and they're right there getting the gig. Do you know what I mean? And, and everyone else is just like, uh, it was hard work, right? I didn't die as such. I mean, it wasn't my worst gig. At that point, my worst gig was actually in the room here two years ago. I was in, uh, I was in, doing a show called The Joys of Retail. And I, I came out and uh, there was an entire front row. Uh, it was a women's institute from Surrey. Oh, and, uh, and I came out and the woman, third from left, said, where you are? I just came out and went, hello! Right? And she just went, oh, God. <laughs> from hello, right? And so I'm sitting there, like they, they just like, it's like a Daily Mail wall of hate. <laughs> they, they just detested me, right? And I'm trying my best to sort of reach them, but no, everyone else is behind enemy lines, right? There was the one smiley, happy person. I think, okay, well, you're being smiley and happy, but everyone else is awful, right? I get to the end of the show, a woman sat nearly where you are. She was on the far right, which, bear in mind, she probably was. <laughs> she sat there, right, and uh, she just must have thought it was a women's institute thing, because she stuck her hand up and just said, Will you be taking any questions? <laughs> and I was so browbeaten, I went, okay. <laughs> and she said, so tell us, what do you do for a living now? <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to do this. And they all just went, oh, and then they all left. Right? Oh. It's okay, it gets worse. <laughs> so 
I was saying goodbye to everyone because I like to say goodbye to people. If people have come and seen it, I love that. That's fantastic. And I sort of think eventually the smiley lady comes out to me, right? Now I just had this tattoo done here. It's two roses because my daughter's called Rosie, right? And this woman comes out to me and she just goes, I enjoyed the show very much, but I, I have a personal question. I hope you don't mind. I was like, by all means, it couldn't get any worse. <laughs> and she goes, tell us, please. Um, why do you have two cabbages on your heart? <laughs> you can't not see it now, can you? <laughs> now that was a bad gig. This one is about to get a lot worse. So, I'm going to do the 9 o'clock show, I'm ready for the 9 o'clock show, I think that's going to be fine, I buried the 7 o'clock show, I think this is going to be fine, I know the show, it's going to be okay, right? I'm about to go out, Tony arrives, goes, Doris on, I'll give you a proper introduction this time, right? And I'm thinking, oh. <laughs> this is what he says, he comes out and goes, ladies and gentlemen, we've got a comedy for you now, now I know usually when we have a comedian on board, it's usually joke, 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 but we're not going to do that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, what we've got, we've got more of a storytelling kind of comedian for you, more of an intellectual type of comedy, might not be your cup of tea, right? Um, he does like the fringe and all those arty things, right? I've seen him on YouTube, he seems to know what he's doing, and oh, by the way, it's his first ever gig on a cruise ship. Ladies and gentlemen, Aidan Gordley. <laughs> yeah, that reaction was actually better than what I came out to. <laughs> so I come out, and I'm thinking I've done enough, I know that I'm going to do this show, I know it's a good show, I start to explain the show, I get three minutes in where I explain I'm from Brighton, and a hundred people get up and walk out. Um, it's as though the very mention of the city is going to turn them gay. <laughs> I'm, I'm furious, because I can't do my usual response, right? Because usually I would just, any, you go to clubs, I do clubs all over the place, and you get, I get homophobia just because I'm from Brighton, and it fucking annoys the shit out of me, right? Because I don't understand why. Okay, Brighton is the gay capital of the UK, but it's also the capital of vegetarian in the UK, and I've yet to do a gig anywhere in the country, turn up saying from Brighton, and have two homophobic pricks in the back go, oh, watch out for your broccoli, lads. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't do that. I can't deal with that response. I can't do that. I'm not even allowed to let them, I'm not even allowed to swear, right? So I'm kind of editing. I'm panicking. I'm in a situation I've never been in before. I don't know what the fuck to do, right? I'm editing the show as I go along. There's a bit in the show where I talk about Die Hard being a gay love story. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm editing the show as I go along and I'm panicking like you wouldn't fucking believe. There's a bit in ten films where I talk to someone in the audience and it looks like it's off cuff. It's not. I know what they're going to do and I know what they're, you know, it's, I get the response. It never fails me. It's a lovely, smiley, happy person. I race across the stage. There's a smiley, happy, thank God there's a smiley, happy person. I ask them the question. Unfortunately, I haven't concentrated and I realise when I ask the question, this person is not going to answer because this lovely human being has special needs. <laughs> <laughs> this is confirmed when the lady next to her looks up to me and just says, oh, she won't answer your love. She's got special needs but she's having a lovely time. <laughs> now normally, right, I would just go, oh, and I'd have a chat, and I'd go, well, welcome, I hope you have a great time, and, and I, you know, I'm, you know, I just want to make everyone feel welcome, I don't want to put anyone down for it, you know what I mean, I just want to put things, but unfortunately, at that exact moment, the spotlight finally catches up with me, and therefore the remaining audience can see me seemingly big on a disabled woman. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> so I carry on, I get 35 minutes and I have to quit. I have to say, if a great deal of irony, thank you for your tolerance. <laughs> and uh, I leave the stage, Tony has a go at me for only doing 35 minutes. I go, well, what the fuck do you expect? You introduced me as an intellectual comedian in front of a Butlins crowd. I storm off, but I couldn't storm off, of course, because I have to go past the bar. I have to go past 2,000 people who fucking hate me. Oh, I, I get outside instantly, there's a small group of people. I think, Christ, they've already set up a lynch mob. <laughs> but these turned out to be lovely people. They were people who go to the fringe and they came up to me and they said, Well, we go to the fringe, we would have seen you there, we would have, you know, we would have seen it, would have worked there. This isn't the venue for you, you know, we're so sorry that you had that reaction, right? And that's fine, that's okay, that's so lovely of them, right? They were being really nice, yeah? And the thing was, the second group of people I ran into were pointers. Right? I'd like they'd be talking to their friends in the bar and then they go, Oh look at it. <laughs> imagine going past a bar, like it's like a wave of people all of a sudden going, Oh <laughs> 
one point when I was in Lisbon trying to get some fresh air and escape, right? I'm in the town square. I think, oh, this is lovely. Look at the architecture. I look across the square. There's 50 of the fuckers. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the third group of people all turned me into Moses, right? They were like the Red Sea. They just parted. <laughs> they just moved out of the way. They just, oh, let's not look in his eye. Really. It was awful. I ran into Jean. I ran into Jean the next day, right? Okay, she goes, oh, how did the gig go? I didn't come because I don't like comedy. It's not my cup of tea. I said, Jean, it was awful. It was really, really bad, right? And she said, oh, I'm glad I didn't come. <laughs> I know, Jean. I don't. I'm glad you didn't come either, right? And so all I did was I just started sort of basically eating a huge breakfast and hiding in my cabin. Because every oh. I mean, I'm not being paranoid. I was getting abuse from people, right? People actively hated me. It's like I'd ruined their whole holiday. So I'm sat in the cabin, and all I've got in there is CNN and the Gideon Bible. Oh. And if you watch CNN for longer than three minutes, you're convinced the world's going to end anyway, aren't you? Right? And I'm sitting there. It was last October when Kim Jong Un and Donald Trump were having a go at each other, and I was just thinking. Oh fuck, what if there is the apocalypse? What if the bombs drop and I'm stuck on this fucking boat with these guns? <laughs> so we just keep seeing Gene eventually, right? I go and see Tony, I feel all the courage, go and see Tony. Tony sits me down and goes, Look, hey, first things first, you should know it's not your fault. And I'm like, thank you, thank you, Tony. He goes, you should never have been booked. You should never have been booked. I mean, I've seen your website. I've seen your stuff online. You don't seem to know what you're doing. But, you know, you're not the right person for this venue. And I was like, well, thank you. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate that as much. At least. <laughs> he said, I would say that, though. He goes, we don't think it's a good idea for you to do the second show. And I'm like, okay. Am I still going to get paid? Right? Because, you know, I'm not here for the culture. Um, you know, so I'll do the show, people have said they'll come, a small group of people, I'll do it in my cabin, I'll do it in the laundress, I don't care, I need to get paid, right? And he said, well, we have to check, you see, because there's been a bit of a problem, there's been a complaint. I was like, oh, right, because I've had people walk out, I've had people swear, but I've never had a proper complaint before, right? and I was really excited, and I thought, oh, I've got to find out what this is, right? I said, well, what did they complain about, right? And apparently, in 10 films, there's a bit where I talk about my daughter watching Raise of the Lost Ark too young, my wife saying she shouldn't be watching this, right? And my response is, well, they're only punching Nazis, you're never too young to learn how to punch a Nazi, right? <laughs> <laughs> because you're not! <laughs> That. Said, well, yeah, they did because there were some Germans on board. I said, the Germans complained? No, people complained for the Germans. This <laughs> <laughs> is fucking insane. I've done this show in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> she says, well, we'll have to let you know. You know, so I storm off. The next morning, I bump into Jean. She goes, are you going to do the second show? I said, I don't know, Jean. I don't know. She says, well, if you do, I won't come. I hope you won't mind, because I don't like comedy. I said, I know, Jean. I know. It's okay. So word gets to me, right? That bear in mind that this ship, right, is going to dock at 7 o'clock on the Saturday morning, right? And at 7.01, there's going to be an Aiden-shaped hole in the side. <laughs> they tell me that the night before, on the Friday night at 11.30, right, they're going to allow me to do it in the raffles bar, right? I didn't even know there was a raffles bar, right? I go to find it. It's half the size of this room. It also oh. contains a piano and a bar. It's so far down in the ship. I get down there. I open up the door, there's no one there behind a guy behind the bar going, oh, they sent help. <laughs> and I don't care, I'm going to get paid, I'm going to get paid, right? So I get there, right, and it's crammed, there's 80 people crammed in there, right? Now I'm well aware that 40 of those people there may have been there just to be lovely and smiley, happy people who just wanted to be nice to the poor chap who had a bad time, and that's great, right? I'm also aware that the other 40 people may have been there just to watch another car crash. <laughs> At this point, I am beyond caring. I just want to do the gig. So I do the gig, and it goes well, right? I did my Joyce of Retail show, and it worked. They laughed, they enjoyed themselves, I felt like king for the day, right? I get my money, I get in the lift, I work out that if I go in the lift, I go across the top sun deck, go back down the rear sun deck so I can get to my cabin without seeing anyone. <laughs> and I come down, I get to the second to last sun deck, bear in mind it's one o'clock in the morning, and there's Jean. She's just standing there looking out at the, at the beyond, you know? I said, Bit concerned, so I said, "You're okay, Jean." And um, she said, "Yeah." She goes, "Oh, just I'm just thinking about the journey that I've been on, right?" 
And it sounded like one of those, you know when someone puts on Facebook, oh, I've had a really bad day, but they haven't given you any details, you know, so you have to go, oh, what's the middle? You know, uh, but this was real life, so I couldn't just go block. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, I said, oh, you know, what's up? And she, and she explained the reason why she was on the journey, right, was that she was a doctor in the army for 25 years, but so was her husband, right? And he passed away that year. And the thing was, is that she just wanted to go back to Gibraltar so she could close, and in her words, close the chapter on that part of her story. So she could start a new chapter. And when she told me that, it kind of, you know, it kind of put everything, you know, put everything into significance. Do you know what I mean? There's this woman dealing with this incredible loss, right? And she's just closing the chapter. She was at that point where she could do it. And then, you know, and I just thought, well, that's amazing. And I just thought about the Bible. And I just thought, well, you know, you get your Bible stories. It doesn't matter where you get your stories from or how you use them. It's how important, isn't it? It's whether you get it from the Bible or where you hear them down the pub or some sweaty man in Edinburgh. It doesn't matter. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you for letting me be part of your story, Jean. And then she said a really lovely thing. She just said, how did the gig go? And I was like, well, it went really well, Jean. And she said, oh, that's really good. I like I said, I didn't come because I don't like <laughs> <laughs> And then she said the loveliest thing. And she just said, well, at least you've got a nice end for your story now, don't you? Aww. And I was just like, oh, thank you, Jean. And I gave her a big hug. And, and we, just, we had a number anyway. And I said, look, I'll speak to you soon. Get some sleep, you know. And I get four feet away, and I swear to God, she just turns to me and just goes, Aidan, I forgot to mention, I did go and see some comedy last year. I paid to go and see some comedy, and I really enjoyed it. I said, really? Who'd you go and see? <laughs> I saw Ramesh Ranganathan. <laughs> Sadly, incredibly true. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an absolute delight to do this show. It's my last show of the Fringe, so it's been really good. Thank you so much for being so lovely. Um, I do, uh, my wife and I do help each other out. She actually asks me to help her with a sermon sometimes. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, and she actually has helped me with part of this show. So if you were paying attention, you would have seen that, uh, or paid attention, you would have realised there were several Green Day lyrics in it. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I've been Andy Goldie, it's been The Vicar's Husband. You guys have been an absolute delight. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you haven't seen 10 films with my dad, it's on 8 o'clock. Uh, it's the last time I'm doing it in Edinburgh. Uh, you said that last year. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I also said it the year before. Uh, and the year before that. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, not a fuck you. It wasn't just me then. <laughs> hey, fuck you all. Uh, no, no, it is, it is the last time I'm doing it because uh, well, cause it just hasn't sold this yet. And, uh, no, no, it, it really is because I'm doing it. Oh, next year. I'll tell you about this because you won't come tonight, so it's fine. Um, so, no, uh, if you follow me on Twitter and stuff, I've got a new show that I'm doing next year called Happy Britain. Uh, in January, I'm going to every single county in the UK. I'm going to the Google Centre of every single county uh, to basically find out if people are happy. Uh, no, it's going to work. It's going to be fine. And um, it's going to be here next year. It's going to be in the big room. It's the 120 seaters. So I really need your help. And, uh, so if you follow me on Twitter, you'll find out all about it. It's going to be a book as well. Uh, so thank you very much. Good night.